Okay, let's now make a start. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, welcome. So great to have you all here. And it feels like things are kind of getting serious with the SALT grant program. We're going to dive in deep to the lean canvas this afternoon. And um, it will prepare us really well for getting together in Brisbane in a couple of weeks time. So I want to begin, um, as always, by acknowledging the tr traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and to pay my respects to elders past, present and future, um, all of the places that we are right now. And um, I'm keen to kick off with a round of introductions. We've got quite a while of working together, which is fantastic. And uh, I thought what we might do to kind of um, perpetuate that collegiality that I hope will characterize all of our time together. I want to do a round of introductions. So I will invite you to unmute your microphone um, one at a time and let us know who you are, where you are. And then the one thing that is kind of top of mind for you right now when you think about either the application writing process or maybe your project in general, What's the, what's the big thing that is on your mind or in your team's mind? And it might be mundane, like what are the formatting requirements that might be conceptual about what kind of theoretical frame you're working within. It might be strategic about how you will engage a particular crucial stakeholder. It could be anything. There's no idea that's too big or small to be worth raising here. But um, I would invite you to, to kick off um, with name, location, and, and what's on your mind. And let's just hear from, from each of us in that regard. Who wants to go first? I can go. Fabulous, James. Talk to Hi. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie, in spite of James on the screen there. Um, <laughs> people call me Jamie. Um, so I am in Cairns and I've just rushed back from an expo we've got here. Um, so we've had a load of uh, year 10, year 11 students um, and we had a, a virtual reality flight simulator. So they were all kind of jumping on top of that and crashing it and it was a bit hectic but uh, it went down quite well. Um, so yeah, my, my project is virtual reality and flight simulators and pilot training and stuff like that. Um, and I guess the thing that's at the forefront of my mind at the moment is just allocating the tasks within the team and defining the roles um, and deciding um, who's going to do what and, and just, getting, just getting the project going. You know, I'm sure once, once that initial stuff is done, then it will start moving forward. But yeah, it's really... You know, allocation of roles, deciding, um, yeah, who's, who's going to go and do what, that kind of stuff. So that's me. Great, Jamie. Thank you. Out of interest, how many people are in your team? Um, for SALT, uh, five. Five. Super. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Does that prompt anyone else to want to jump in next? Is there a similar theme or a contrast? All right. I'll jump in then. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Meena Jha, and I'm located in Sydney campus. And uh, uh, I have actually four team, four members in my team. And the one thing, what is coming in my mind is, um, I want to say that what uh, you know everyone shares in this uh, uh, workshop, and how me and my team can be benefited out of it. And uh, of course, how to move forward from here. And, uh, you know, in the, and during the workshop, if I've got any questions and uh, would like to get the clarification on to it would be great. So that is all of from me. Thanks, Kelly. Fantastic, Nina, great to have you here. Now at the end of this session, we do have time for questions and answers, but as always, please jump in at any point with comments, questions, and so on. Um, much, much more productive if we um, respond to your interests and questions as we go along. So please do jump in and do that, everybody who's on this call. Who okay, I'll go. Um, I'm Julie, <clears throat> based on Rockhampton campus. Um, and our large team is Gemma and myself, and Gemma is also in this presentation. Um, 
I guess um, foremost for us is sort of taking on um, the feed, taking on board the feedback that we received. Um, and for me, I'm feeling a little bit stressed about not being able to be part of the um, the Brisbane experience next week because it's week 12 when I teach and it's just not practical. Um, but Gemma will be there, but I feel like I'm, yeah, I feel like I should be there and I can't be, but that's, we'll get through that. Um, but yeah, and excited, excited to think what we might be able to find out. Fabulous. So just on that point about Brisbane, if anybody is in that position of not being able to be there in person, we welcome you jumping in via Zoom at any point. Um, Marlene and I are just finalising the program, so we'll be able to get a pretty precise timeline to you shortly about when things are on. And Julie, please, if there are gaps in your schedule where you'd like to join in, um, let's make that happen. Um, so that you don't entirely miss out. Not as good as being there, but it would be great to have you on board as much as is feasible. Gemma, can we hear from you next to keep the theme of that one project? Sure can. So um, I'm not sure if Julie just mentioned that, yeah, I'm in Rocky as well. And it's around the STEPS course that we're, we're looking at. And we are excited to, to find out some new information. Uh, we've always heard anecdotal information, so I think it's... What I'm looking forward to and thinking about is what are the outcomes? I know that's thinking way too in advance, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the right time to be thinking about outcomes. It's funny because almost always in grant applications, outcomes get listed near the end, I guess, because chronologically it's where they start to show up. But conceptually, I've always thought that's where our thinking should begin. Because what are we doing if not trying to design for tangible outcomes? So Gemma, I love that you're thinking about them already. I reckon you're right on time rather than way too early. Doing that. Fabulous. Who is next? I'll go next. <laughs> there you go. Great, Malia, hi. Uh, um, sorry, is it me? <laughs> All right, my name is Malia and um, I'm based in Rockhampton, uh, part of the podiatry team. Um, there's seven people on our team. Five of us are from the podiatry team. One person's from business and law, and one person's from engineering. So we've got a diverse group of people on the team, and we are looking at um, 3D printing a foot um, to use for teaching students. Um, and I think what's the foremost thing on our minds right now is um, because most of us are relatively new academics, so I think how do we put it in a form where we're using the right terminology um, and we're using the right approach. Um, I think that's what we are um, thinking of at the moment um, towards the project. So we've got something that's um, in a very raw form. So we've got a 3D foot that's in a very raw form and we're looking at in making improved versions of it. Yeah. Fantastic. We've got sessions in Brisbane um, directly on the language issue and also on the research approaches issue. So you're going to find plenty to get your teeth into there. And I, I hope, I think that the lean canvas work that we do together this afternoon will be a helpful frame as well. And yeah, that is a diverse team. What a fantastic project. Excellent. Who's next? I'll go next, Shelley. So, uh, hi everyone, this is Annie. I'm here over here in Perth. Um, this is our second, we tried for a SALT grant last year and was successfully shortlisted, but we missed out in the long run. So I guess first and, first and foremost um, at the moment is really looking at the feedback that we've got from last year and this year and working through that. Um, and I did the Lean Canvas last year with Tilly and it's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's a great tool um, for this and you can use it, you know, in other areas too. So yeah, I'm looking forward to stepping back into it today. Fantastic. Annie, this is going to be very familiar to you. So please feel free to value add with your comments and reflections along the way, given that you've used it um, quite a bit already. Great to have you here. Who's next? I can be next. My name is Manjo. I'm with the School of Business and Law. I'm based in Brisbane. Our project looks at uh, developing mini workshops on positivity to help improve the mood and uh, well-being of students prior to a tutorial. And what I'm thinking right now is whether or not there is actually a need to expand 
the scope of the study in terms of adding, encouraging other unit coordinators to join the, the, the grant application in order to enhance the chances of uh, getting the, the grant accepted. So that's what I have in mind right now. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so that generalizability piece is really crucial to show either that the idea will directly impact people in multiple um, units or that there's potential for it to happen. So this is a great time to be thinking about whether you want to hardwire that into your project design. Um, it can be really strong to do that, much stronger than, than making an argument that you expect that people might take the findings up afterwards. You know, if you've got them in there on the ground with you, then generalizability is um, much more kind of readily established. That's great, Manjo. It's great to have you in the group. Who are we still waiting to hear from? Uh, it's Judy here. You haven't heard from me yet. Hi. Um, so I'm Judy Broadhurst and I'm um, at the Rockhampton campus. Um, and I have just lost the file I was going to refer to. <laughs> back again okay some of the things uh, my project is looking at um, the online delivery of components of an interprofessional education um, module that includes speech pathology occupational therapy and clinical psychology and um, so the team includes uh, representatives from each of those professions um, uh, and includes um, people with very limited research experience such as myself, but also people who um, have their PhD. So there's a quite diverse group within that. Um, uh, so my questions foremost in my mind, um, uh, I, I actually have some questions around methodology in the sense of how do we... Um, set up an online learning experience and what supports are there in to tap, that I can tap into to make that happen. Um, and uh, because we're really wanting to look at the effectiveness of that delivery, but we, we need to establish that to deliver it, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So can we, Judy, are you with us to the end or are you one of the, the colleagues who has to teach at two o'clock? No, I can be with you now till the end. Okay, super. Marlene, would it be possible in the Q&A to address that question of what kinds of support LTS might be willing to provide in terms of setting up online learning resources? Not to make any promises, but just to talk us through the strategy of who you might contact and um, what might be available in LTS. Is that, is that a feasible thing to do? In terms of what, sorry? In terms of what Judy was asking about, what resources might there be for setting up online learning uh, interventions as part of the project? So not as part of normal course, course delivery. So the things that our academic developers do, nothing to do with them or something. Well, to do. Judy, do you want to jump in and clarify that at this point so that Marlene can be thinking about it as we go through the workshop? Yeah, so there's... I guess there are, there's um, the the project is running at the moment. You're utilising some um, connections between campuses, um, but what we're wanting to do is add some more online experiences. So the students are watching some videos that we can, uh, or some interactions with a a person, um, maybe asynchronously and then bring that to the discussions that they have in the classroom, which is also cross campus, I might add. So this is, this is within a certain unit of study? Yes, it's in three units of, it's embedded in three units of study. So do you, guys, do you guys have anyone from LTS that works with your school in terms of developing curricula and that sort of stuff? Well, there probably is. Um, I'd have, that's a good question. So I can find out the answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there is, but if there is, then they would probably be able to help you if you're trying to set something into a course, like to be delivered with your course or yeah. in conjunction with your course um, yep. or unit. I'll get the terminology right eventually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I'll, I'll keep thinking about it and I might just do some talking around the back here in 
my office and just see yep. what I can find out. Fantastic. Great. Okay. I think we still need to hear from Lisa and Jeff. Yes. Okay. I'm Lisa Skinner and that's beautiful timing because I'm part of Judy Broadhurst's team. Uh, I am at the Rockhampton North Campus, um, but I have very much taken a back seat um, and Judy has been the, uh, the leader in this whole process. So I guess the foremost thing that I'm thinking about right now is just um, where to from here. So I'm being more involved in it next term. And so I'm very, very general at the moment as in what am I doing um, and what is uh, lean canvas. And yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm here just to listen and absorb anything that I possibly can and then to talk to Judy about where to from here. Fantastic. Sounds like a plan. And Jeff. Sorry, just finding the people. Um, yes, so I'm Jeff Chapman. I'm based down on Sydney campus. Uh, our project proposal is all about the new taxa requirements that have been put in place for sessional staff to engage in scholarship in their field uh, in order to be our oh, casual teaching staff, sessional staff, whichever term you use, in order to be employed by the university. So yeah, we're looking into what the university's response has been to that and the policies and procedures and so on um, that has formed and basically looking to inform any uh, further policy or uh, sort of provide a review of the effectiveness of that, uh, of the approach the university's taken. Um, there's about seven people in our team, most of which come from the School of Business and Law, uh, including myself. Uh, we do have one member from the School of Engineering and Technology and I guess in that regard, probably one of the biggest things we're thinking about at the moment is how to scope the project most effectively. Uh, our proposal put in um, basically said we'd try to look at both, oh, actually three schools, sorry. Um, we have School of Engineering Technology and Teaching. Um, Julie Fleming from Education is on board as well. So we're looking at all three schools, but trying to work out the logistics of looking at uh, casual staff across all three schools it may become a bit big. So I guess that's what we're thinking at the moment, how to uh, effectively scope the project in a way that we can actually get some good findings. Yeah. Fantastic, Jeff. Super. Now, have I missed anybody or does that cover all of us? There's uh, Jamie Shield at the end. I'm not sure if he's there. He... I thought I could sneak under the radar here. Uh, I'm from Cairns. I'm in a team of seven across ICT, IATD and law. Uh, we're mm -hmm. looking at trying to reduce student plagiarism by trying to measure the, trying to capture or identify the origin of students' work. So if they do some work in class and we try and identify that using processes and tools and uh, the idea is then that provenance will hopefully uh, be measured at the end of the assignment when they finally submit or they'll be sub submitting along the way and that hopefully will reduce the prevalence of plagiarism. Um, and what's foremost was, in your mind? Sorry? What's foremost in your mind? Uh, foremost in my mind is trying to address the uh, feedback, the, yeah, the feedback. Uh, the questions about uh, uh, some relevance issues and some generalizability issues that um, um, we don't really have a good handle on yet, but we'll, we'll work through it. Fabulous. And we've got time set aside in Brisbane for one-on-one -on -one discussions with everybody in the grant support team and obviously with each other as well. So um, that will be a good spot to kind of workshop those ideas as well. So we have two people called Jamie from Cairns. Jamie Shield, I'm really sorry that I overlooked you. That was what went wrong in my list. <laughs> I didn't realise there were two of you. Um, so then I think that leaves us with Marlene and Michael, um, who you both know, but I might just ask you both to, to say hi and um, what's on your mind right now about Bolt Grant? So hi everybody, I'm, I'm Michael Cowling. I'm based in Brisbane campus, currently on the Gold Coast at my house. Um, what's foremost on my mind, uh, how many EOIs we said yes to in that last round, so how many I'm going to have to read in the draft stage and, and how good they're going to be. And I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you all next week at the residential um, to get a really good feel for how things are going, uh, hopefully 
the end result being some really great stuff that we can read in a few weeks at the next draft meeting. Absolutely. That reminds me to say that um, as much as is feasible, the same reviewers will read your full proposal documents as read your EOIs. So you're going to get this great follow through of feedback from people who are getting to know your thinking and, and able to see your developmental process. And you help us with that as well, because in the full proposal format, you write a reflective piece about how you took the feedback on board, what's on your mind, um, that kind of thing, a little like you did in the EOI, that final segment. Um, and so the great thing about um, the system that we use is that you get to almost build a relationship with your review panel members who are reflecting on your applications. Um, and so Michael's not alone in looking forward to reading the next cycle of them. Um, I know from talking to other panel members that they're all really deeply engaged in um, the really interesting work you're doing and they're excited to read what comes next. And Marlene, fresh back from holidays, what's on your mind? Yes, what is on my mind? <laughs> <laughs> not much at the moment. No, I'm just um, trying to get my feet back under me um, after reading through all my emails yesterday. Uh, yeah, I'm learning and teaching grants and awards officer, as you all probably know. And yes, I'm frantically organising the workshop next week. <laughs> the background stuff, not the stuff that Tilly's doing, the background stuff. So, yes. There is, there's a lot of it. And I feel like June is arriving very, very quickly, quicker than yes. most of us might might want it to. Yes. All right. So let's jump in then to the Lean Canvas, the focus of this webinar. I've just once again pasted into the chat window um, a link to grab the PDF documents if you haven't had a chance to do that already. You're going to be seeing some slides where the writing is very small and it's there for illustrative purposes. You're going to find it a much more effective session if you download those PDFs. So jump into the comment box and do that. Essentially, our focus today is to talk about the Lean Canvas as a planning tool. I want to give you a quick overview of how it came to be and what I think of as the anatomy of it, um, why it is kind of built like it is. And then we're going to do a guided tour of it frame by frame, looking at um, the left and the right hand sides of the document. One half of it is, is essentially in summary about getting the research done and the other half of the Lean Canvas is about that research having a purpose. Um, this idea of salt research existing to make a difference to students, staff, institutions, the sector and so on. And then we've got dedicated time at the end for discussion and questions. But like I said before, this is a very open informal session. So please jump in at any point at all. So the Lean Canvas looks like this. Um, you will have seen when you downloaded the documents that you've got a couple of versions of it. One of them is a worked example from a fictional project in humanities, just because sometimes it's helpful to see what a filled-in version would look like. You've got another version that um, is in that download folder, which is blank designed to be printed out at A3 so that you have room to handwrite on it. Um, and then you have a version where you, uh, which is like the one that's on the screen right now, where you've got some blue text, which is in there as a prompt, but within your PDF viewer or maker, um, you can type over that text to give you the space that you need to personalize it to your project. Um, if you're working, in a team, particularly across different locations, you might find the electronic version more useful than the old fashioned A3 paper, um, writing it by hand. But sometimes doing a mix of both can be good as well. The kind of kinesthetic benefits of, of getting the pens out and filling things in by hand can be a useful thing to do as well. So the way that this canvas happened is that um, for, for the last kind of 10 years or so, there's been this uh, evolving model of a lean canvas and it was designed in the business development startup world to be an alternative to the lengthy, cumbersome, heavy business plans that used to be the norm for any um, 
business that was that was kind of finding its way. And instead of this, there was this model proposed that was essentially a one-page dashboard that summarised the essentials of a new business idea. What would be the unique value proposition of that business? Who would be buying the product or service? Where would the market be? You know, those kinds of questions. And the idea of this dashboard lean canvas was that it, it's designed to be completed quickly and revised often. It's not a business plan that's kind of laboured over and polished and perfected until it's this shining artefact and then the business can begin, but it's something much more nimble, much more deft, much more able to be um, worked and reworked, you know, on the run as business founders find their feet, clarify their sense of, of the possibilities of their enterprise and so on. And so a couple of years ago, um, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a similar kind of thing for scholarship of learning and teaching research as a, a precursor to digging into these application documents and, um, you know, filling in all the required headings and having this very overarching comprehensive picture of on um, how the project will function and what change it's seeking to affect and why and how we know it's worth funding and all of that work, all of that legwork that an application has to do. I thought, wouldn't it be a powerful thing if we could represent all of that on the one page a bit like a Lean Canvas does? So, as we all do, I went to Google and I found that indeed there was something quite a lot like that. Um, not in the scholarship of learning and teaching space, but in the research, um, in the discipline-based research space. The University of Auckland had collaborated with UWA um, to create this document called Plan on a Page Research Proposal uh, Template. And so with their permission, um, I adapted that um, to be a Lean Canvas specific to learning and teaching research projects. And so that's what you're seeing um, in this workshop today. That's what you've downloaded. The one thing you're not seeing yet, but you will see it at the workshop in Brisbane, is a map that directly translates each box of the Lean Canvas into the different sections in your CQU application template. So right now, because we're still firming up that document, that's the one missing link in what you have to hand but there will be a document that tells you the correlation just to save you having to each figure it out separately, um, the correlation between what you've put on your Lean Canvas and where it belongs in your actual application. So the idea of the Lean Canvas, the key idea is that this is about working in a quick and in the beginning almost impressionistic way. And then once you get something down on paper to keep honing it um, keeping it brief, keeping it simple, keeping it to this one page kind of overview so that it can all stay fresh in your mind and kind of active all at once. Because sometimes, especially working in teams, whether it's, you know, five members or seven or whatever size you are, um, it's easy to get bogged down in the details. So the Lean Canvas is a resource offered to you as a kind of a, um, a dashboard, a quick helicopter view of everything that is at play in order to make your project a success or your application a success and then after that the project. So like I've said you've got that link in the chat window there are different versions of it. Um, if you're printing I recommend you always do it in A3 just to make the font kind of big enough um, but you'll figure out how it's useful to you. So um, what I propose we do, because as usual, this webinar is very much about you having time to work on your project, much more valuable that you get to hothouse things here rather than just being talked at by me for an hour and a half. So I want to start the timer and give you 14 minutes to jot down um, something in each box of the Lean Canvas. So to make that a worthwhile 14 minutes, I need to know for sure that you've all been successful in downloading it. Is, any, is anybody having any trouble getting to that link? Maybe a few people can type reassuring messages in the chat window to say that you've got it. How are you going with that? 
Otherwise, it's going to be 14 not very useful minutes. Okay, I'm seeing lots of all goods. So I think we are good. Fantastic. All right. So um, I am going to set the timer. And each time that one minute passes, I'm going to just let you know that the minute has passed. And I want you to skip to the next box. So I'm intentionally doing this before we've done the guided tour of the whole Lean Canvas because I think there's enough in it and you know enough about your project to get some impressionistic things down right away. Okay, the numbers in the boxes are a suggested sequence to do them in. So I'm going to prompt you every minute or so to jump to the next numbered box. And if you've got any questions, I'm going to ask that you don't ask them over the mic, but just type them in the chat window and then everybody else can keep on working uninterrupted. If there's anything that you all need to know, then I will jump in and let you know that as we go. All right. 14 minutes is starting now. Um, have fun doing your first impressions on the Lean Canvas. The documents are PDF in answer to Mandra's question, um, and it's a PDF that you can type into if you have downloaded the one that says it's fillable. And Mandra, if that does not answer your question, just shout out in the chat window again, and we can figure that out. Okay, I can't believe it, but the first minute is up. So jump into box number two. And another minute's passed, so jump into box number three. If you're getting through them quicker, please do feel free to jump ahead as well. Okay, it's time to jump to the next one. And the advice is that you're proceeding chronologically by number. So you'd be up to number four now. That's in the box that is numbered four.
and onto the box that is numbered five. And then we're on to number six, which is exploring your research approach. A minute for that one. And then number seven, a favourite of mine, which is dissemination. And we are now moving on to number eight, which is research impact right there in the heart of the lean canvas. And if any of these you're not quite sure what you feel inclined to write there, it's absolutely fine to leave them blank for now. We're going to dig deeper into them as we move on. Now we're up to number nine, which is envisioning the end of the project. What will be the success indicators to know that you've done what you set out to do? And then we're up to number 10, which is the research outputs, the tangible things that you're going to make 
in your project. And then the all important question of how much will it cost? So we're up to number 11, which is research expenses. And we're almost through our sprint. <laughs> Okay, and the final one, number 12, which is competitive advantage. That is that minute up. I'm going to give you a minute to just look back over, fill in any extra thoughts that have occurred to you as you've moved through the document. A minute to do anything extra that's on your mind. Okay, and in the 14th minute, the invitation is to mark on your document or make a note of the one area where you think you are really strongly positioned, which of those feels like your strongest link, and which of them was difficult to write or feels like it might be a gap at this moment, and chances are there will be at least one that, that is a gap at this stage because it's early stage still. So just make a mark or make a note of the area in which you were best positioned and the one where you think your team still got some work to do. Just a couple more moments to do that quick overview, best and worst.
and that's our 14 minutes. Oh, that was a sprint. Um, so the reason I wanted you to do it this way is that your project is the most important thing. And so I wanted you to jot down your initial immediate impressions from the knowledge that you have of developing your project. And then now let's plug in some extra background and explanation of each of the 12 elements of the canvas, and then you can keep on fleshing out those initial thoughts that you grabbed. Um, it can be a little tempting if you hear the explanations first to kind of lose track of your particular project and, and get a bit hung up on, on kind of the framework itself. So um, to keep your work right at the pinnacle of your attention, um, I wanted to give you that 14 minutes to, to get some things down. But now let's have a look at um, each of the segments of the Lean Canvas. And, uh, and please feel free to jump in with questions, comments, anything as we go along. What you're seeing on your screen now is a worked example. Um, you may have downloaded this from that folder already. This is an imaginary project in the humanities. And as we go through each box, um, this will be, I've just cut out the, the box um, with these answers filled in just to give you an applied example of the kinds of notes that might be written into each one. So this is a, just in big, broad, general terms, it's a project that is about community-based work-integrated learning for students in the humanities who might not normally access work-integrated learning. It's not one of the traditional fields in which will happen. So that's the innovative nature of this imaginary project that, um, that you see fleshed out in the canvas. So like I had forecast before, the Lean Canvas is split really in two. Um, half of it is about doing the research, half of it is about making a difference, and then there are some things that, that span across both of those, some that, that don't fall easily into one box or the other, and those things really are the research impact because the way that you do the project affects the kinds of impact, but then of course the impact you achieve is the thing that makes the difference. And the other thing that spans very much across the both of them um, is the unique value proposition, the really particular thing that each of the team members and their context kind of brings to the project. But I'm getting my, ahead of myself, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, the numbering, like I was saying, is a suggested sequence to complete it in. But that's really, you know, the first time you do it, that sequence makes sense. What I hope you'll start doing is using this really as a dashboard. So you'll be jumping in and changing and updating and honing things in, you know, with, with whichever number needs attention. You're not going to constantly have to work all the way through. Um, and then you will have noticed that there is shading in uh, how many is that five of the boxes and they're really the artifacts that remain um, after project completion because there are things that are ephemeral in fellowship of learning and teaching research um, but then the the purpose the intent of doing good salt research is that you leave your mark and it lasts for a long time and so those shaded boxes are really about the mark that's left, you know, what tangible outputs exist, what difference will have been made, how will dissemination have happened and, and what will success um, look like for the users and beneficiaries of the project. So that's the kind of system in terms of coloured and not coloured boxes. So we're going to take the left hand side of the Lean Canvas first and do a, a quick whip through with just a couple of comments and your questions or reflections on any of them. So we're going to do the kind of the doing the research side of things first and then we're going to jump across into the making a difference um, side. So the very first one is to identify the problem and the context. Institutions want to fund projects that address a living real problem that something more than just, you know, this would be an interesting thing to know more about. There's got to be a pain point, something that's going wrong that um, makes it worth spending some money on. So the prompt here in this one is to, to be really disciplined in describing in just a handful of bullet points, as few as you can really, 
um, what's the surrounding context and the challenges that will be addressed by the research? What's going on that needs fixing? Um, and one of the useful things to do here is imagine that somebody just steps into your office and says, you know, what's playing on your mind right now? How would you explain to them the problem that's playing on your mind that underpins this grant idea? Is it that students aren't comfortable going out on their, you know, very first work integrated learning placement? Is it that employment outcomes are less positive than they could be? Or in our humanities example, is it that the broad and liberal nature of an, a humanities arts curriculum can be seen as disconnected to tangible career paths? So here you're sketching out what's going on and you're also noting what already exists institutionally and in the sector. So this is a little bit lit review and a little bit about understanding the context in which you're operating. So that is problem and context. This is about framing the reason that your project idea is worth giving money to, potentially over and above somebody else's project idea. So you want to be making the strongest possible case about what the, what the issue is, what's the concern here. And then, and because you'll note that we're doing everything on the left-hand side of the page and then the right, so we are not actually going in number order. Um, the next thing that's on this side of the canvas is what the solution is. Now, obviously, in your SALT project, you're going to be testing solutions. Um, and you won't be able to give an exact kind of pricey of how you're going to solve the problem, because if you knew already, you wouldn't need the grant funding. But what you want to forecast here is what strategies you're taking to solve the problem that you've identified. So in our humanities example, the solution, we could call it the intervention as well, is placing students in community-based teams with an academic mentor, giving them a chance to translate their humanities skills and knowledge into solving something that's going on in the organisation. And then to describe the scope of it, it's four pilot projects in interested organisations. That will be mirrored back a little later on when we talk about the users and beneficiaries box. So there is overlap um, between, between several of these. And then the next one, this one um, is really central to persuasiveness in a grant application. It's the unique value proposition of your project. What's the essence of it? What's the most crystal clear single message that you could give about why this project deserves to be funded? And one of the ways that I like to get to that answer is to think about what would be lost if the funding didn't arrive in the current round? What is so important and timely about your project idea that it needs to happen now? And how can you describe it in a, you know, a quick, punchy kind of way. This is one that will probably change several times through the development process. Um, this is the, the briefest elevator pitch of, what's your project about? This is like the shortest sentence you could offer of what it is that you're seeking to do. And the value proposition is kind of a pigeon pair with, um, with, what we come to later on about um, the users and beneficiaries. You want to be naming in this section who it is that's going to derive a benefit from the work that you're doing. So here we can clearly see that it's humanity students and we know how the transformation is happening for them. It's through community-based service learning or will. The other thing that's really closely linked to this one, and we'll get to it right at the end, it's the last one, um, is that competitive advantage box about the unique thing that your team brings to it. But we're not quite there yet. And then the research approach. Now, this one, it's hard to squeeze it into six bullet points or fewer, but I invite you to, to really try and keep it tight like that. So the two things that you're seeking to do in this bit of the Lean Canvas is to state your research questions 
tell us what they are. And we'll revisit this in Brisbane. Um, but we did work on this last time that we were online together about different ways to frame research questions depending on your approach and what you're seeking to find out and so on. So then after listing your research questions, describe the methodological and strategic characteristics of the research approach. So drawing on the literature, what is the methodology and the, the way of thinking, um, the approach to knowledge that you're seeking to use in your project. And then what's the strategic characteristics? Are you doing policy change? Are you doing advocacy? Are you doing um, assessment reform? Are you doing professional development for a particular segment of um, university staff? What is the, the game plan of how you're getting the work done? Research impact. This is one of those ones that straddles both because it's about doing the work and also about making a difference. And research impact is as simple as this, the actual things that are going to change within the sphere of influence of the project. Temporarily, we're talking during the project and also afterwards, because as you'd know, not all of, all of the change that you want to achieve is going to neatly be wrapped up in a bow by the time you write your project final report, if only the world was like that. It's going to take time. It's going to take a few cycles of teaching. It might take time for policy reform to get through the various committees and governance structures of the institution. It might take time to complete the professional development and then have a cycle of teaching um, where people can actually implement it and so on. And then this is where generalizability starts to come into the story. So think beyond your immediate context. Who else? Who else could be interested in taking this up? And how can you be, like I mentioned earlier, how can you resist the temptation to just presume that other people will find your project useful and adopt it? How can you show that you've hardwired into your project approach other people taking up your findings? And then this one is the easiest one to write. Research outputs, the real, actual, tangible things that you're going to make in your project. And there's a list of prompts there about the kinds of things they might be. Publications, edited journal issues, or indeed books, um, practice handbooks, guides, implementation materials, presenting at conferences, being cited by other people. Um, so the actual tangible things. Now, review panellists will be much more convinced if you are specific about the outputs that you intend to achieve. So a general statement like, we will publish two journal articles could be strengthened by saying, we intend to submit journal articles to the International Journal of Work Integrated Learning and the, you know, name another one, heard maybe. Um, also flagging what you might write about in each of those journals, making sure that it is aligned to the editorial requirements of them can be a way of showing the panel that you're really on top of the expectations um, of those journals and that you're going to get that publishing done. So in this example, I've suggested this split that in the International Journal of Will, it would be a, a pretty hands-on applied article about the initiative and the outcomes. And in HERD, which is about research and development in higher ed or about SALT, um, it would be a methodological article about the research approach taken. Your, your articles might be entirely differently framed and pitched, but the idea is that you show the panel that you're already kind of nutting out what kind of journal does this research belong in? And then it's not just all about journal articles, it can also be conference papers, and it might be products as well, like a promotional video or um, a set of resources or um, any other tangible product that your project is seeking to make. These slides, by the way, will be available. Um, I might so that you can have them right away. I'm just gonna toss them into that same folder that you downloaded the PDFs from. They will go up on um, the LTS staff net as well, but so that you've got them straight after this session, I'll put them in that folder that you've been linking to today anyway.
And then research expenses, how much do things cost? So the procedures are really important and useful here because you've got to make sure that everything you're wanting to spend money on is procedurally compliant. And there's a list here of some of the things that you might be considering in terms of cost. And then here you're thinking both about actual costs, um, things that will take money, that will take a budget spend, or in-kind costs. Is your school offering you some admin time from a colleague within the school? Is, has LTS agreed to come on board and give you an academic developer for a period of time? Um, so it could be actual or it could be in kind. Um, and we're also talking here about funding that's drawn out of the grant money and then funding that is offered from um, other sources, particularly your school. And you know that general principle of grant development is that the more money that's coming from other sources other than the grant, the more convinced the panel's going to be that people are on board to support your work and that they see the value in it. And if you have a whole range of stakeholders who are putting up some money or some services, it can be either, um, it shows that there's a readiness and an interest and appetite for your work and it can really strengthen um, the case that you make. So we've covered that left-hand side. I'm gonna pause for a minute and ask if there are any questions or reflections um, either based on what you did in your quick sprint through filling out the canvas or those comments that I've just made on, on each of those. Can I just make, the make yes. one comment about the in-kind contribution? The, um, the budget spreadsheet that will be available to you guys actually makes the calculations for salary for you. So you just put in the level and how many hours and it'll work it out, including on costs because the enterprise agreement doesn't have any on costs on there, but they are a real cost that come out of your project if you're employing a research assistant or whoever. Um, the in-kind contributions are for you as well, so for your time, and that's something that needs to be signed off a bit later on in the program um, by your DDLT. So your workload that you're gonna be putting into the project is also one of the in-kind contributions that need to be put in the budget. And that's Great. It for me. Thank you. Excellent. The raw spreadsheet sometimes evokes trepidation in applicants. Um, I think it's fantastic because it does all of that maths for you and it allows you to, to juggle your figures. You know, what difference would it make if our research assistant was this fraction of time rather than this fraction? How would that change the final number? Much easier than doing back of the envelope calculations to try and get to your target um, total figure. And I've also, so then, tried, I've also tried to simplify it so it's not as complex as the one that they use in the research office. So it's specifically aimed at the SALT grants rather than everything. Fabulous. Good, good. And we're going to drill down into that when we're in Brisbane together next week. So then um, let's talk users and beneficiaries. So this is a really crucial kind of frame for your research. This is about identifying who is it who's going to benefit from the research once it's applied um, and or translated into practice. And be really specific in what program, in what year of the program, in what actual chronological year. They're the kinds of questions that you want to answer. And then here as well, the more you can show generalizability, the more convinced the panel might be of the value for money of the project that they're going to get change within that will, you're going to achieve the change, but they are going to facilitate or leaven the change, um, not just in your immediate unit, unit, but more broadly as well. And so this is an opportunity to think, and I know that some of you are doing this already because you've got these really interesting cross-disciplinary teams and um, thinking about where else are people struggling with this opportunity or problem and then how could your work intervene there and bringing those people on board? The only cautionary note I'd make about this box of the Lean Canvas is that more is not always more. So offering a project that fixes this problem across every single CQ Uni campus and most programs and all of the schools and at all year levels, 
it's going to be impossible to convince the panel that within the funding and the time period of this project that you can achieve that. So think big, but think realistic as well would be my tip for this one. Strategic partnerships. So this is really about figuring out where change happens, where and how change happens to get you to that research impact box that's right in the centre of the lean canvas. Who are the key people, organisations and committees that will be key to getting you there? Do you know them already? Do you know how they work? Do you know how policy change happens at the institution? Do you know how to convince a dean of, um, you know, requiring different PD across the school, for example? And, and does that dean have a hunger to do that? Have, have they identified that there is a, an area of opportunity? Is there an appetite for the work or will that need to be cultivated? And sometimes there are really valuable projects where other people have not yet developed this hunger to fix the problem. You know, they don't know that it needs fixing, which is fine. Your project, though, is going to have to do some cultivating work to sensitise people to the importance of fixing what is going on. How will you engage throughout the project? We know from all the research about research impact and dissemination that you can't just sweep in at the end and tell people how things should be done differently. You've got to have them within the fold of your project, have them engaged all the way along. And then thinking about that old um, implementation curve of who might be your earliest adopters and who might resist, who might actively resist or be disinterested in your work. Dissemination, so this is a box for thinking about how you're gonna share the research, how you'll share it with others, how it might be translated into practice and how it will be applied in order to get to benefits and lasting change. We're gonna do more work on all of these, but, um, particularly this one when we're together in Brisbane. And then success indicators. So this is that one of really envisioning how are you going to know that this has made a difference? What would that look like? What's your plan to evaluate? What are your metrics? How big do you think the success will be? And also this is the spot for risk management. What could get in the way of that success? And then competitive advantages. So this is a real selling point to the review panel. What is it about your team composition, the environment in which you're working, or the proposal itself that is uniquely yours, that nobody else could make the same claims about? So in our example, the competitive advantage is there's a pre-existing collaboration between these two key external stakeholders and the project team, which is gonna build confidence in the funder that you're already working well together. You're already, they're on board, you know how each other works, you've got existing relationships. That's a real competitive advantage to somebody sweeping in and trying to build this from scratch within the life of the project. And another example um, of a competitive advantage is that key change makers are already on board. So in this example, the dean's already highly supportive. So you're, I don't know, 80% of the way there if you've got a dean on board ready to, you know, open the way for a success. Um, or there might be some kind of efficiency like the unit outline that's at the centre of this idea has already been accredited. So that's a time saving of who knows how many months that you're not starting off right at the beginning of the accreditation process, you've already got all of that paperwork kind of in hand. So then all of those come together into this one page snapshot, changeable, impressionistic, something that you will keep updating and revising as you reflect on the feasibility, the achievability and, and the purpose of your project but it's quick and easy to make these adjustments. This is also a really powerful tool in clarifying understandings across the team. If you've got seven people in your team right now, you may well have seven very different opinions about why your project matters and how it's gonna do the work that it needs to do. 
So getting it down in this really condensed type form is a way for team members to say, hold on a minute, I thought we were benefiting this other group of stakeholders. Hold on a moment, I thought we were using a mixed methods approach, but this seems very heavily qualitative right now. Can we adjust the balance a little? Or, gosh, I've thought about how much this will cost and we've missed out on a whole lot of cost points in the research expenses box. So it's about getting it kind of all down on paper so everybody can be clear about where to next. And using the Lean Canvas, you can get closer and closer to these kinds of goals of writing an application that's exciting, that has a unique value proposition, that is something that only you and your team could do, that's got internal consistency, that's hooked in to what matters to CQU, what's driving the institution, that shows the relational aspects of project success, that this is about understanding the needs of different people and the relationships between them, um, that literature and context is underpinning the decisions that you're making, that you're not being excessively optimistic about what's possible, that you're staying realistic whilst being generalizable and then generating both change and knowledge production, which is always the double edge, isn't it, of thought research, that projects need to leave the context different, and I'm gonna say better, than it was before, and also that you're contributing to the body of knowledge through publication, conference dissemination, and so on. And then great applications, of course, are well-written, and much more on that when we are together in Brisbane. I wanted to give you this link and I'll post it into the comments um, in a moment as well. Um, this, this is a fantastic tool if you're suffering from writer's block um, or struggling to express an idea. This is kind of like a, a dictionary of phrases that are commonly used to do academic things like to show the differences between two ideas or to describe that a gap exists in the research or to highlight what you're contributing. Um, and you can just dip into this and find expressions to literally drop into your application. So I commend it to you, it's tremendously useful. Um, just as a way of thinking about how to language these applications. Um, excellent for if you're feeling stuck. Oh, and Michael, you're saying that it's awesome. Yeah, it is, it's fabulous. So, so good. Okay, so we're almost up to Q&A and I will stop speaking at you in just a minute. I wanted to give you a quick preview of what we will be doing together in Brisbane next week. Uh, I won't read those out to you, but I'll leave you to have a look at them. If there's something that you were hoping that Brisbane would do that is not showing up on that list, now is your moment to, um, to put in a bid for a change to the program. Um, we'll certainly, over the day and a half that we're together in Brisbane, there's loads of flexibility. We might spend more or less time on particular things. You've got working time to be writing and having consults with us. But if there's something that you really thought that Brisbane would do and it's not in there, then um, tell us now and we can, we can build it in. So on that note, I'm going to leave that slide up there so that you can digest that. But on that note, let's turn over. We've got just under 15 minutes left. Um, <coughs> comments, questions, what's on your mind? Yes, fabulous. Yes. Yeah, that's right. We've got a question from Mina, so I might answer that one to start with. Asking for the project template, it's very close. Um, maybe Marlene can tell us when she intends to share that. I know for sure that you'll have it at the Brisbane workshop, but you might be able to get it a touch sooner than that. Well, as long as everything is all A-OK -okay based on the minor changes this morning, then yeah, it can be sent out with the recording for this, which will be probably tomorrow. Fabulous. All right, Michael, I need you to explain something else about your question. Team composition, question mark, what do you need to Say oh. About that. oh, I'm just suggesting that maybe a bullet in there might, because Jamie mentioned, was it Jamie? One of, the, one of the other people mentioned that he's thinking about who's on his team and what each person is contributing. 
Jamie. Yeah, super. That was the first Jamie um, allocating tasks in the team. Yeah, so let's add that in to Brisbane. Excellent. Um, James Cross, preparing things in advance for Brisbane. Bring your bring all of your materials with you. We'll send you an email with some reminders about what to bring, but um, any documents you're working on, definitely your feedback from the review panel, that's important to bring. Um, depending when we get the application template out to you, if you've dug into that and done some writing, of course, feel free to bring that. But I know that the Brisbane workshop is quite soon and there's no expectation that you will have started that writing yet. Um, you'll have lots of time to do it in Brisbane. Um, they're the main things to bring and make sure that you're able to access um, any other documentation that your team are drawing on. You might have an EndNote library of journal articles, you might have some bio statements that you've been collecting together because you know that there's going to be a section in the template where you describe um, the profile of each member of the team. So just bring all that because it's a real working session. The more you've got, um, the more you'll be able to use that time really productively. Tilly, can I just ask you about the pitch? Yes. Is that, um, we all have to do that or? Because I read the email and it sounded like we could choose to do it or? Yeah, so I've never, I've been inviting people to pitch projects for, gosh, it's been like 10 years or some ridiculous length of time um, that makes me feel old. <laughs> um, I've never had anybody dip out of the pitch, but by the same token, I'm never going to force you to do it. Um, so what's going to happen in terms of pitching is the beginning of day one, you're going to have a couple of minutes to pitch your project and you're going to get feedback from each other about how convincing your pitch was. Like, yes, I would fund you in a heartbeat. Mm, I'm not sure it needs a bit more work or I'm unconvinced. And we're all going to share that feedback with each other. Um, if for some reason you do not feel inclined to do that pitch, it's fine with me, but I hope that you'll jump in and do it because you're going to get this incredibly valuable feedback from you know, a dozen of your colleagues and a few of us as well. And then you loop back and you pitch again at the end of day two. Yeah, yeah I and saw so that. Mm -hmm. How things have changed. And there's an opportunity on day two for um, verbal feedback from colleagues in the room who can um, make really tangible suggestions about how to strengthen your project idea. Okay, great. So you won't be forced to do it, but you'll be um, warmly encouraged to jump okay. in. Let it go. All right, good. So, is, is that just a, a stand-up pitch? We're not preparing a presentation or anything like that? Just no, like, no preparation in advance. Um, no slides, just you standing up and speaking to it. Great. And so, it will be timed. So, three minutes or five minutes? or? Oh, it's. I think it's three minutes on day one I think that's what I gave you and then two minutes on day two because I know you're going to be even tighter with what you want to say okay. um, so it's pretty quick and I'd really encourage you not to give the pitch much thought before you come to Brisbane um, you're going to have time to get prepared for it I mean you're welcome to do some advanced prep if you want to but that's not the idea um, you've got lots of other things to spend your time on so um you'll have time in the workshop to get the pitch ready. Don't, don't make it into something bigger than it has to be. We've got a question in the chat window about how many projects will be funded this year. And Marlene, I'm going to defer to you on that question. Okay, so uh, we do have a limited amount of funding, but it depends on the project. If the project is seen as being strategically important to the university and it's in addition to what would normally be funded, then it could potentially be funded. But the, the last day is with Pro Vice Chancellor Learning and Teaching. So um, what happens is your application comes in and gets reviewed by the panel, well, by two panel members, and then recommendations are put forward to the Pro Vice Chancellor Learning and Teaching for projects that are recommended for funding like for this year. Um, at the moment in the procedure, it says that we'll fund approximately five projects that are in the smaller range. So 2,000 to 5,000 and one project requiring the larger budget up to 10,000. But as I said, it'll depend. 
And there is precedent, isn't there, for more being funded than that yeah. that's listed in the procedures that's happened before? It has happened before. It depends yeah. on the quality of the application and the need for the project, I, I, I'd I, say. So, yeah, agreed. Yeah, it's very important that the need for the project is clearly established if you want, if you want it to be like pushed forward as a recommendation, so yeah, or well, the whole, and that you that you make it kind of irresistible to the review panel, so that the the panel goes to the PVC and says, Look, "This is crucial. This has got to happen. Can you find some extra money?" That's the level of convincingness that that we want you to get to. And if it's not funded this year, there's always the opportunity to revise and relodge it next year. So, I mean, you will already have had this development program to work on it. So you should have a significant application document ready to be tweaked for next year, if that's the case, but it may not be the case. Yeah. I, having been part of the panel for a few years, I would say that you're more competing with yourself to produce a good quality application than you're really competing with the other 10 people that will be in the room next week. And 10 projects that will be in the room next week. So, um, yeah, think about it that way. Think about polishing a good application rather than how many people in that room need to get hit by a bus for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's definitely the spirit of the residential in Brisbane. It's um, whenever we do these, we try and keep a spirit of collegiality rather than competition um, because that's going to be better for everybody. Um, if you are open and generous with giving feedback and support to each other, it'll lift the standard of the entire EOI group and, uh, and be a much more productive couple of days than if you're thinking, oh, I better hold my ideas back because the person next to me might steal them. You're all doing really unique projects and, and so ideas aren't stealable, but wisdom and strategy is definitely shareable and we're going to invite you to do lots of that kind of sharing next week. James Cross, no fighting. We haven't had fighting yet. Let's let's not make that part of this year either. <laughs> you don't need to bring your boxing gloves down with you, James. Yeah, yeah, that's not in the packing list. <laughs> um, I had one more thing for your list, Tilly. Just looking at some of the comments people made at the beginning, Jamie Shield, the other Jamie, mentioned the balance between writing a project that is specific for his discipline versus making it generalisable. And I don't yeah. think it's something worth working in there. Yeah, yeah, let's wrap that up a bit as well. Balance between generalizable and discipline specific. All right, friends, we've got about five official minutes left, although I'm not rushing off anywhere, so I'm happy to hang back if there are particular questions. Um, Judy, I know that Marlene has an answer for you about um, online material development, and that might be pertinent to others. Marlene, do you want to post that in the to everybody um, chat window? Okay. Oh, and then while that's happening, any other questions, comments, reflections, anything before we formally wrap up? Hi, Tilly. I wanted to know if um, uh, we could get the information as to the number of EOIs that we have been accepted so far. I, mean, I, I, think, I, I think, think we can, any. Michael. Uh, I mean, I don't remember the exact number, but about a dozen. Um, I think have gone through to the next stage. Thank you. Yeah, great. Anything else? All right, well, let's formally wrap things up there. I will drop these slides into that shared folder. Um, so that you can just grab them right here whilst you're here. I'll do that as soon as we hang up from this session. I want to thank you so much for participating and for jumping in and doing that 14-minute sprint through the Lean Canvas. I hope you found it useful in getting a big picture of what it is you're seeking to do and why it is so important to pursue the work that you're doing I'm super excited about working with you in Brisbane next week. I noticed that in your bullets, Billy, so should people bring that down? Sorry to interrupt. That's all right. Can you uh, again? Should people bring the lean canvas down with them next week? 
And yes. are you going to spend some more time on it or? Absolutely. We are going to have some A3 printed copies, some blank ones um, for you to use. But if you've got one um, printed up, please bring it and definitely make sure that your e-copy of it is, is ready on your laptop and definitely, as well. Definitely bring the feedback as well. So you've got that to refer to while you're redeveloping. Yeah, yeah, that's really crucial. And I was also um, gonna, going to say, sorry, again, um, in relation to Michael's comment about everyone being collegial in the room, that sort of thing, it's so early in the program that there are a couple of um, review stages between now and the final application. So, you know, it's not as if your project that you bring and pitch next week is going to be your final project necessarily after development. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the richness of feedback is just going to be better and better the more that you're comfortable sharing it in our few days together. Okay. Well, let's stop the recording and uh, you're very welcome to sign off. But if you've got anything you'd like to ask or explore off the record, then um, the recording will be stopped and we can just keep on chatting for a moment. And thank you all so much. I'll see you next week.